Hello, welcome to Serenity Productions. Thanks, BB, for the tea. And tell Cypher to get over it, please. At some point, they're gonna have to confess to one another, and honestly, I think we're all the volition that sooner would probably be better than later. <laughs> it wasn't your fault. They're the ones that let you in. If it was really important, Scales would have growled you away. Now, yeah, well, next time maybe just leave them alone if you really feel that inclined. Anyway, we should probably get back to our research. I'll see you tomorrow? Okay. Thanks again for the tea. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Scales is gonna let BB love that one down for a very long time. But that is neither here nor there now. And honestly, I'm beat. Between the train getting attacked and us going through this massive amount of research again. I could definitely use a break from everything and everyone at this point. I mean, Jesus, how many books did you and Cypher take from that library? And how did you even get them all out? <laughs> Alright, well, you know what? I'm saying we're done for the night. You've, like, speed-read through half of that pile already, and if I read one more thing on ancient ruins and cultures, I might scream. Research was never my forte. You know what we haven't done in a while? A mystery night. <laughs> I know that you have books there in your thing, so let's just... Pick up a book that we actually want to read, instead of books that we don't want to read. Let's just sit on the bed together and just, you know, have a mystery night. I know this is important, but, I mean, if we burn out, are we really going to be helpful to anyone? I think we should just take the night. Relax a little bit. Enjoy the tea. And a good story. I mean, look at this train we're on. It gives me Orient Express vibes. And honestly, what better time to enjoy a mystery novel than when we're trying to solve our very own mystery, right? Come on, Fangs, you know I'm right. So I say, we put the research down we get onto that big comfortable bed, we pull out a book, and we just enjoy for the night. Right? Okay, so I'll get the book, and you bring the tea over to the nightstand, and we'll just go. <laughs> okay. Okay, I grabbed it. Of course I grabbed Sherlock. Okay, besides Agatha Christie, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is the next best mystery writer, in my opinion. And, well, I'm in the mood for a bit of Sherlock. <laughs> I can try starting off reading it. I think I've got my, uh, old English lingo a little bit down better than last time. If I mess up on a word, just let me know. I'll try to get it better. But, uh, yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright. Uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, this one is the, um, The Hound of Baskervilles. <laughs> Chapter 1. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He likes to use that a lot for Chapter 1, doesn't he? <laughs> Mr. Sherlock Holmes 
who was usually very late in the mornings, save upon those not infrequented occasions when he was up all night, was seated at the breakfast table. I stood upon the hearth rug and picked up the stick which our visitor had left behind him the night before. It was a fine, thick piece of wood, bulbous-headed, of the sort which is known as a panging laurier. Just under the head was a broad silver band, nearly an inch across, to James Mortimer, M.R.C.S., from his friends of the C.C.H., was engraved upon it, with the date 1884. It was just such a stick as the old-fashioned family practitioner used to carry, dignified, solid, and reassuring. Well, Watson, what do you make of it? Holmes was sitting with his back to me, and I had given him no sign of my occupation. How did you know what I was doing? I believe you have eyes in the back of your head. I have at least a well-polished, silver-plated coffee pot in front of me, said he. But tell me, Watson, what do you make of our visitor's stick? Since we have been so unfortunate as to miss him and have no notion of his errand, this accidental souvenir becomes of importance. Let me hear you reconstruct the man by an examination of it. I think, said I, following as far as I could the methods of my companion, that Dr. Mortimer is a successful elderly medical man, well esteemed, since those who know him give him this mark of their appreciation. Good, said Holmes. Excellent. I think, also, that the probability is in favor of his being a country practitioner who does a great deal of visitings on foot. Why so? Because this stick, though originally a very handsome one, has been so knocked about that I can hardly imagine a town practitioner carrying it. The thick iron ferrule is worn down, so it is evident that he has done a great amount of walking with it. Perfectly sound, said Holmes. And then again, there is this, the friends of the CCH. I should guess that to be something Hunt, the local Hunt, to whose members he has probably given some surgical assistance, and which has made him a small presentation in return. Really, Watson, you excel yourself, said Holmes, pushing back his chair and lighting his cigarette. I am bound to say that in all accounts which you have been so good as to give of my own small achievements, you have habitually underrated your own abilities. It may be that you are not yourself luminous, but you are a conductor of light. Some people without possessing genius have a remarkable power of stimulating it. I confess, my dear fellow, that I am very much in your debt. He had never said as much before, and I must admit, that his words gave me keen pleasure, for I had often been piqued by his indifference to my admiration and to those attempts which I had made to give publicity to his methods. I was proud, too, to think that I had so far mastered his system as to apply it in a way which had earned his approval. He now took the stick from my hands and examined it for a few minutes with his naked eyes. Then, with an expression of interest, he laid down his cigarette and carried the cane to the window. He looked it over again with a convex lens. Interesting, though elementary, said he, as he returned to the favorite corner of his settee. There are certainly one or two indications upon the stick. It gives us the basis for several deductions. Has anything escaped me? I asked, with some self-importance. I trust there is nothing of consequence which I have overlooked. I'm afraid, my dear Watson, that most of your conclusions were erroneous. When I said that you stimulated me, I meant, to be frank, that in noting your fallacies, I was occasionally guided towards the truth. Not that you were entirely wrong in this instance. The man is certainly a country practitioner, and he walks a good deal. Then I was right. 
to that extent. But that was all. No, no, my dear Watson, not all. By no means all. I would suggest, for example, that a presentation to a doctor is more likely to come from a hospital than from a hunt. And that, when the initials CC are placed before the hospital, the words Charing Cross are very naturally suggested themselves. You may be right. The probability lies in that direction. And if we take this as a working hypothesis, we have a fresh basis from which to start our construction of this unknown visitor. Well then, supposing that CCH does stand for Charing Cross Hospital, what further inferences may we draw? Do none suggest themselves? You know my methods. Apply them. I can only think of the obvious conclusion that the man has been practicing in town before going to the country. I think we might venture a little farther than this. Look at it in this light. On what occasion would it be most probable that such a presentation would be made? When would his friends unite to give him a pledge of their goodwill? Obviously, at the moment when Dr. Mortimer withdrew from the service of the hospital in order to start in a practice for himself. We know there has been a presentation. We believe that there has been a change from a town hospital to a country practice. It is then, stretching our inference too far, to say that the presentation was on an occasion of the change. It certainly seems probable. Now, you will observe that he could have not been on the staff of the hospital, since only a man well established in London practice could hold such a position. And such a one would not drift into the country. What was he then? If he was in the hospital and yet not on staff, he could have only been a house surgeon or a house physician, little more than a senior student. And he left five years ago. The date is on the stick. So your grave middle-aged family practitioner vanishes into thin air, my dear Watson, and there emerges a young fellow, under 30, amiable, unambitious, absent-minded, and the possessor of a favorite dog, which I should describe roughly as being larger than a terrier and smaller than a mastiff. I laugh incredulously as Sherlock Holmes leaned back in his settee and blew little wavering rings of smoke up to the ceiling. As to the latter part, I have no means of checking you, said I, but at least it's not difficult to find out a few particulars about the man's age and professional career. From my small medical shelf, I took down the medical dictionary and turned up the name. There were several Mortimers, but only one who could be our visitor. I read his record out loud. Mortimer, James, M.R.C.S., 1882, Grippen, Dartmoor, Devon. House surgeon from 1882 to 1884 at Charing Cross Hospital. Winner of the Jackson Prize for Comparative Pathology, with essay entitled, Is Disease a Reversion? Corresponding member of the Swedish Pathology Society, Arthur of Some Freaks of Atavism, Lancet, 1882. Do we progress? Journal of Psychology, March, 1883. Medical officer for the parishes of Grippen, Thorsley, and Highborough. Not to mention of that local hunt, Watson, said Holmes with a mischievous smile. But a country doctor, as you very astutely observed. I think I'm fairly justified in my inferences. As to the adjectives, I said, if I remember right, amiable, unambitious, and absent-minded. It is my experience that it is only an amiable man in this world who receives testimonials. Only an unambitious one who abandons a London career for a country. And only an absent-minded one who leaves his stick and not his visitor cards after waiting an hour in your room. And the dog has been in the habit of carrying this stick behind his master. Being a heavy stick, the dog has held it tightly by the middle, 
and the marks of his teeth are very plainly visible. The dog's jaw, as sewn in the space between the marks, is too broad in my opinion for a terrier, and not broad enough for a mastiff. It may have been, yes, by Jove, it is a curly-haired spaniel. He had risen and paced the room as he spoke. Now he halted in the recesses of the window. There was such a ring of conviction in his voice that I glanced up in surprise. My dear fellow, how can you possibly be so sure of that? For the very simple reason that I see the dog himself on her very doorstep. And there is the ring of his owner. Don't move, I beg you, Watson. He is a professional brother of yours, and your presence may be of assistance to me. Now this, the dramatic moment of fate, Watson, when you hear a step upon the stair, which is walking into your life, and you know not whether for good or ill. What does Dr. James Mortimer, man of science, ask of Sherlock Holmes, the specialist in crime? Come in! The appearance of our visitor was a surprise to me, and since I had expected a typical country practitioner. He was very tall, thin man, with a long nose like a beak, which jutted out between two keen gray eyes, set it closely together, and sparkling brightly from behind a pair of gold-rimmed glasses. He was clad in a professional, but rather solvent. Slovlian? Slovlian? Which one is this one? Slovenly. Slovenly? Okay, fashion. For his frock coat was dingy, and his trousers frayed. Though young, his long back was already bowed, and he walked with a forward thrust of his head and a general air of peering benevolence. As he entered, his eyes fell upon the stick in Holmes' hands, and he ran towards it with an exclamation of joy. I am so very glad, said he. I was not sure whether I had left it here or in the shipping office. I would not lose that stick for the world. A presentation, I see, said Holmes. Yes, sir. From Charing Cross Hospital. From one or two friends there on the occasion of my marriage. Dear, dear, that's bad said Holmes, shaking his head. Dr. Mortimer blinked through his glasses in mild astonishment. Why was it bad? Only that you have disarranged your little deductions. Your marriage, you say? Yes, sir. I married, and so left the hospital. And with it, all hopes of a consulting practice. It was necessary to make a home of my own. Come, come, we are not so far wrong after all, said Holmes. And now... Dr. James Mortimer. Mr. Sir. Mr. A humble MRCS. And a man of precise mind, evidently. A dabbler in science, Mr. Holmes. And a picker up of shells on the shores of the great unknown ocean. I presume that this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes whom I'm addressing and not. No, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Glad to meet you, sir. I have heard your name mentioned in connection with that of your friend. You interest me very much, Mr. Holmes. I hardly expected such a... Dulce... I hardly expected so... Dulceophilatic? Flick? Oh, okay. <clears throat> a skull. Or such a well-marked superorbital development. Would you have any object to my running my finger along your... I always get mixed up on the medical words. <laughs> Parietal fissure? Oh, <laughs> okay. A cast of your skull, sir, until the original is available, would be an ornament to any anthropological... <laughs> museum. It is my, my intention to be fulsome, but I confess that I covet your skull. Sherlock Holmes waved her strange visitor into a chair. You are enthusiast in your line of thought, I perceive, sir, as I am mine, said he. 
I preserve from your forefinger that you make your own cigarettes. Have no hesitation in lighting one. The man drew out paper and tobacco and twirled one up in the other with surprising dexterity. He had long, quivering fingers as agile and restless as the antenna of an insect. Holmes was silent, but his little darting glances showed me the interest which he took in our curious companion. I presume, sir, he said at last, that it is not merely for the purpose of examining my skull that you have done me the honor to call here last night and again today. No, no, sir, though I am happy to have the opportunity for doing that as well. I came to you, Mr. Holmes, because I recognize that I myself and an unpractical man, and because I, suddenly confronted with a most serious and extraordinary problem, recognizing, as I do, that you are the second highest expert in Europe. Indeed, sir. May I inquire who has the honor to be the first? Said Holmes with some asperity. To the man of precisely scientific mind, the work of Monsieur Bertillon must always appeal strongly. Then had you better not consult him? I said, sir, to the precisely scientific mind. But as a practical man of affairs, it is acknowledged that you stand alone. I trust, sir, that I have not inadvertently. Just a little, said Holmes. I think, Dr. Mortimer, you would do wisely if without more ado, you would kindly tell me plainly the exact nature of the problem it is which you demand my assistance. How did you do with that one? Uh, there's some words here. I just don't know what they are. It's amazing how many beautiful words were lost in the English language. We now use things like lit and, well, brel and whatnot. <laughs> do you think you can continue reading the book? You have a little bit more knowledge of the old English language than I do, and you don't slip up as much. <laughs> Plus, I like hearing you read. <laughs> then I hand the book over to you, <laughs> and you can continue. I'm going to go for one of those cups of tea, though. <laughs> I miss Mystery Night. I think this is exactly what we needed. <laughs>